This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. I will start since as a convener of this next session, and I will ask uh, uh, Misha to come later. You know, I think it's uh, uh, what uh, Lou asked. Uh, it was absolutely legitimate question, and uh, I think if uh, society, not only bureaucracy, but society, would not uh, be uh, told what happened, why it it was originally planned for five billion. Either. Now we're talking about 55 at least. So what happened? Something you know has to be clarified. So before we are going to uh, space and astrophysics, I, I would like to say a few words. I am probably the only well, survivor of earlier period, not 1961. I joined the fusion program at, in the Soviet Union at Kurchatov Institute since 1956. And then there was a famous Geneva conference in 1958 with uh, all this, you know, the great people, you know, like Lyman Spitzer, Marshall Rosenblut from America coming. So I, I was there. And uh, it was almost officially declared at Geneva in 1958 that fusion energy would be harnessed in 20 years. It was, uh, 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 it was coming uh, from the mouth of chairman of Geneva Conference, uh, pr prominent Nobel Prize winner, Indian physicist Homi Baba, and uh, uh, Igor Tam, co-inventor of Tokamak, Tokamak was a co-chairman. He was sitting next to him. But you know what happened? Nobody actually uh, noticed the rules of the game for fusion changed dramatically since that time. How initial uh, role of fusion was very simple. So in a you know, hundred, couple of hundred years, uh, assumption was that we will uh, get rid of uh, uh, conventional fuels, so they will move to nuclear uh, and uh, fission energy. And uh, we know that how much we can uh, uh, extract uh, uranium-235 out of natural uranium ores. It would probably uh, sufficient for a few hundred years, maybe a couple of thousand years. And then people said, then we will uh, uh, use fusion. And this is how actually, Charlie, first connection between plasma physics and fusion and oceanography came, that uh, world ocean is infinite source of uh, heavy water of deuterium. <laughs> so, and then if you would go to uh, nowadays, the uh, uh, global uh, warming, uh, ecological society, you know, a new uh, uh, greener thinking says, no, we need fusion not in a, that long time. We need fusion before tipping point for global warming. And uh, I overheard uh, uh, the previous, uh, uh, the former Secretary of Energy, uh, Stephen Chu, even s remarked, if fusion is only in 50 years from now, uh, we don't need such fusion because of the tipping point. So this is what actually happened. So coming back to uh, the intermediate source of energy as a, a nuclear fission reactors, which uh, initially people uh, thought could serve us for 200, maybe more, up to 2,000 years. What's happening there, it's very also very interesting, very few people follow actually. The biggest uh, business in uh, conventional nuclear energy, in fission uh, reactors, is now decommissioning. Everyone is running too close to decommission existing nuclear fission uh, uh, power stations because of uh, uh, sudden success of fracking. 
That's what's happening. So we have to reconsider all the fusion uh, efforts. And in, in that respect, uh, uh, Bruno quoted several times uh, my participation in 1985 uh, Reagan-Gorbachev summit. Story was very interesting. Of course, the main issue which uh, uh, Gorbachev, our team, were uh, uh, to bring to Geneva was how to deal with the Star Wars. It would dis destabilize international relations. And Gorbachev uh, said, okay, this is very important negative argument, but would you guy able to come up with something positive so we could work together uh, with Americans. So uh, the scientific community uh, was invited in. We had a lot of discussions. And finally, two proposals were suggested. And uh, uh, Gorbachev spelled them at the meeting with Reagan. So uh, one proposal was for this big tokamak, which in eventually uh, uh, was called ITER, uh, many years after Reagan already was gone. But there was another proposal, very interesting, uh, which was coming from Russian seismology community. They said, you know, we are worried about uh, uh, California. It is at tremendous risk of earthquakes. So uh, conversation went in the following way. Uh, Gorbachev to Reagan, you know, we are worried that you are endangered species, Americans. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Reagan said, and you are not? <laughs> so, yes. so who was right now, you can decide. So there was no interest uh, on uh, um, President Reagan's side to cooperate on uh, seismology, on earthquake prediction. So our colleague, uh, Vladimir Kelis Borak, who was the originator of, of this idea of cooperation, uh, had to take initiative, uh, emigrated to UCLA, and uh, he, he was a professor at UCLA. Probably some of you met him a number of times. He passed about a year ago. So on fusion then finally was moving. The first step in fusion was eight uh, uh, billion size proposal, ITER-1. And uh, there was a lot of criticism, and uh, uh, there was a collective open letter in science about 10 years ago. Bruno uh, uh, and myself, we were co-signatories. We were arguing against ITER-1 because uh, the physics was not yet clarified. And it was too expensive. It was very expensive. Uh, the, uh, the requirement were to have uh, eight billion dollars. So there were other critics, and the uh, US Congress finally declined to continue ITER-1 project. So a couple of years later, uh, ITER-2 came, uh, said, oh, OK, we are saving money. Now it would be uh, costing only 5 billion. So now we are talking about 55. I, I'm afraid that uh, without explanation, anti-science uh, sentiments you know, would explode in the face of uh, the, this story. Talking about uh, fusion, uh, I would like to uh, use, uh, to show a couple of slides. Okay, so it's what I already told it. So actually, no, interesting, uh, the only skeptic of early fusion success was uh, Dr. Edward Taylor. He said, no, it would not come before end of uh, 20th century. Okay, so, uh, can you imagine the time when Charlie, as a young man uh, with a bachelor's degree from Harvard, joined Princeton, uh, Princeton Plasma Lab? Tremendous time. Everyone was expecting fusion would come very soon. Moreover, in terms of uh, global uh, astrophysics, uh, 99, it was known that not at that time that 99 plus uh, part of the universe made of a baryon uh, matter was in state of plasma. <laughs> so, and there were another applications. Charlie, uh, in a few years, would join AFCO Everett, which was building MHD generators, which uh, were also expected as a tremendous success. So, what uh, uh, we uh, should feel at the time, oh, very simple. We felt that we plasma physicists are masters of universe. <laughs> and uh, so when Charlie joined uh, Princeton Plasma Lab, uh, Lyman Spitzer was a director. 
uh, and uh, uh, Ed Freeman was the head of theory, was the man, first mentor of uh, Charlie. And uh, uh, I have to tell you that when uh, uh, Soviets in Geneva first met American fusion physicists, because until then everything was classified, the only idea in fusion which was not known, what no, was not independently suggested on Soviet side, was a stellarator. Extremely ingenious, intelligent project. And uh, uh, so Lyman uh, Spitzer was a really great uh, physicist, great thinker. Unfortunately, uh, stellarator lost its competition at the time to Tokamaks. Tokamaks very kind of straightforward, very robust. But uh, this, was, this uh, experiment, uh, uh, this projection was much more intelligent because uh, nobody expected that you will have magnetic services enveloping, you know, the providing plasma confinement without uh, additional current, you know, driven from uh, external source. However, uh, uh, it didn't work mostly probably because there was a conflict between uh, two irreconcilable symmetries. Helical symmetry, which took, which provide the idea of stellarator, and uh, toroidal symmetry when you will close it. So symmetry break up created chaos in magnetic uh, field lines behavior and then in the particles. So that was the future. However, uh, nothing bad happens with a good outcome. Uh, Lyman Spitzer uh, had to abandon eventually fusion and uh, lab plasma and he went back to astrophysics and uh, we uh, have a lot of fruits out of this. Hubble is the first fruit. The idea of space observatory he conceived long before space age uh, in uh, uh, 1946, I think. <coughs> yeah. So before Ch Charlie had to decide what to do, there was a Sputnik launched in uh, 57, and uh, in uh, 58, early 58, Van Allen radiation belts were discovered, and that became the very first extremely successful topic for Charlie to study with Harry Pechik, uh, discovering uh, what uh, 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 Herb Burke was mentioning uh, as the escape of electrons, but also protons, due to collective behavior of plasma, kind of self-organization providing uh, radiation belt environment more acceptable for all of us. And uh, I, I can tell you an interesting story related to discovery of Van Allen radiation belts. Since Soviets very first in space with Sputnik 1, uh, there was a very careful, uh, carefully prepared experiment to measure potential energetic particles in the orbit by Soviets. But uh, Khrushchev said, no, it, uh, we need first to send a dog before we will send scientific <laughs> experiments. <laughs> so Laika was sent uh, in the uh, end of 57. Uh, 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 so and then in early 58, everything was ready to launch a, a pre-Van Allen radiation experiment by Soviets. And uh, uh, Karolov, who was the father of Soviet space program, uh, summoned all the participants uh, to, uh, to find out if everything is okay before launch. Everything was okay except tape recorder to take, to uh, record the data along the orbit. Scientists said, no, no, we, we should not launch today. We should wait until tape recorder would, uh, would be repaired. And uh, Karolyov looked at them and said, no, we are going to launch. So it was launched radiation, enhanced radiation, energetic uh, protons were found only uh, in one location over Baikonur launching site. No more data <laughs> from site. So uh, years later, Karolyov uh, confessed what happened, why he made such a instruction. He said, very simple. I got a phone call from, uh, from Khrushchev that morning who said, he got a, call, a phone call from uh, uh, Italian uh, Communist Party leader, Palmiro Tagliati. Yes, yes. So you see, again, you know, Italians play the role. <laughs> and uh, Tagliati said, Comrade uh, Khrushchev, can you launch something? Uh, tomorrow we have a 
parliamentary elections, if you would, it would give us a few more million votes. So intervention of politics is tremendous. Charlie and I, in the late 70s, co-chaired the US-Soviet working group on uh, what to do after Apollo. Our uh, 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 subject was, can we uh, have a docking between uh, uh, orbital station, uh, salute, and shuttle, and do some more science jointly? It failed uh, next year after Soviet invasion to Afghanistan. So, Bruno, uh, you came up with interesting project with Velikov, Igniter. This morning, I read the uh, Russian press. Uh, Ukrainian government declared that there is a massive invasion of Russian forces into Ukraine. I doubt that uh, now this project will go on. So uh, Charlie was a lucky one. He left fusion very uh, almost at the beginning of his creative career, and he achieved everything. And uh, main uh, 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 main uh, uh, interest at early phases very uh, chaotic behavior of unstable plasma leading to different leaks, like uh, leaks of energetic particles. Second topic was uh, collisionless shocks. And uh, today, at this session, we have uh, two talks somehow related to this issue. So I would like to ask uh, Misha Malkov to talk. Misha Malkov, uh, uh, I remember I recruited him after he graduated from uh, university in Moscow uh, to Space Research Institute. Uh, he uh, was a theorist in the group of Alex Galeev. And then uh, in uh, late 80s, early 90s, he spent some time, a year or two, with uh, Charlie here in California working together on chocolates and other stuff. And uh, then he spent a few years uh, in Germany uh, and uh, about 10 or 15 years uh, moved. Uh, and now he is a research scientist uh, at uh, La Jolla. So, okay, Misha. Uh, so yes, uh, as Ralph say, uh, my name is Misha Malkov. I, I am delighted to be here and uh, to present some some uh, <coughs> Charlie's early achievements uh, and his basically his legacy he, he left to astrophysicists uh, before he moved to, to other <coughs> important <coughs> uh, activity in his career and I, I'd like to thank Charlie and Ellen for inviting me here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about one <coughs> specific aspect of uh, Charlie's work uh, in, in plasma physics, and uh, uh, Bruno, by the way, complained about uh, a lack of recognition that uh, astrophysicists uh, show towards uh, towards plasma physics. Uh, and I, I am trying to. I, I think I, I will try to convince you otherwise. So we have at least one example uh, when uh, astrophysicists do recognize uh, what what has been done by. Uh, professionals in, in, in plasma physics. And uh, one example is, of course, uh, it's what, what, what Charlie did uh, in collision, uh, collision shocks and energetic particles associated with them. Uh, so uh, I, I will quickly, uh, so the, the basic object that I'm going to talk about uh, is cosmic rays. Uh, and I will uh, quickly explain what it is and how collision shocks are uh, related to, to cosmic rays, and uh, then I will quickly describe some specific mechanism which is now considered to be the main uh, mechanisms uh, respons uh, responsible for, for the production of these cosmic rays. Uh, okay, and what, what, what are the cosmic rays? They, they, uh, they are, by the way, not rays. It's a sort of uh, misleading uh, name. It's, there are particles, and uh, They've been discovered uh, slightly more than 100 years ago by uh, Victor Hess in this uh, kind of brave uh, balloon flight. And, uh, but, but now, of course, uh, uh, things changed quite a bit, and uh, we have a, a full range of different instruments, of, of which only a few are shown here. It's mostly the idea is to observe the sky at night and see 
uh, what traces this cosmic rays leave in, uh, in, in, the, in the atmosphere, and then uh, analyzing the direction and uh, the amount of energy ultimately released uh, at the ground level, uh, we can <coughs> figure out what, what is the energy of the primary uh, particles uh, hitting the atmosphere. Uh, <coughs> Why, why cosmic rays are important? If you look at the history of particle physics, you realize that uh, in early days, up to about maybe 1950 or so, most of the, uh, much of the progress made in, in particle physics is, was really due to cosmic rays. Most, most of the discoveries uh, also uh, awarded by uh, uh, Nobel Prize uh, they, 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 they've been made in, in cosmic rays. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, the, the cosmic rays, uh, the, the spectrum, if you uh, look at the energy spectrum uh, of the cosmic rays, it's really quite amazing. It extends up to the energies uh, of, uh, of, of about 10 to the 20 electron volts, which is, uh, which is comparable to the energy of well-served well tennis ball or, or even football. And, uh, and the, the places where they are presumably accelerated, it's, it depends, of course, a little bit what part of the spectrum are you looking at. Uh, up to this point, which, which is called need, it's, uh, if you look at more carefully at the spectrum, there is a little kink here about the energy 10 to the 15 EV. Uh, these particles are most likely to be produced in these beautiful objects, which are supernova remnants. And uh, what, what is <coughs> actually remarkable about this object is that uh, the, uh, the limbs are, uh, uh, are the collisionless shocks. That's, uh, that's actually what one of the Charlie's uh, uh, beloved uh, subjects in plasma physics, he advanced uh, uh, quite significantly in, in, in 70s and 80s, and which, which are currently actively used in, in astrophysics. And uh, uh, so what, what are they? The, the, the co basic concept of collisionless shocks is you, you can understand it uh, if you have a flow in, in so, say, hydrodynamic flow with a relatively smooth profile of velocity, then you have particles moving faster here and slower here, and then uh, sort of, sort of uh, in pigeon, these the slower move, moving particles and have to transfer their momentum and energy to them. And how to do this if there are no collisions, so the, the plasma is so rarefied. Uh, and the idea was that uh, the idea was that, that the waves should should be responsible for that. And the details are quite complicated, and uh, uh, things have been advanced by. Uh, a number of Charlie's work uh, uh, works in uh, in this field, and uh, uh, the, then uh, uh, what 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 does this all uh, have to do with cosmic rays? Is that uh, at collisionless shocks, it, it turns out that you, we, we can uh, use them to accelerate particles. So if you have a profile of velocity which is uh, suddenly changing from upstream to downstream, and particles is kind of uh, trapped between this media and bouncing force and back and, and it gains energy. And uh, the, <coughs> the aspect that Charlie understood quite well was the non no basic nonlinearity of the entire process. Not, not only these particles are parasitically accelerated, they also generate waves that uh, help to confine them. And uh, that's uh, the, the subject that uh, uh, Charlie has advanced. Uh, very, uh, very substantially, and 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 the nonlinearity is, uh, in particular, uh, uh, reflected in in the form of back reaction of these particles on the, to the flow. Uh, okay, then uh, the the acceleration basically <coughs> consists of uh, of three uh, major uh, phases. It's one is injection, how how particles. Uh, get promoted from thermal thermal continuum to the uh, some special population which can further continue 
bouncing forth and back, as I said, between upstream and downstream sides of the shock. And then finally, particle escape uh, when, when they reach a certain energy or get into the uh, specific part of, of the uh, phase space. Uh, and all that is controlled by wave particle interaction and self confinement effect when, when particles, they drive waves uh, and uh, the confinement is, is basically uh, magnetic and as, <coughs> as Herb told us uh, that it's easy to confine particles uh, across the field but it's harder to confine them along the field and uh, Charlie studied the uh, ion cyclotron instability as a means to, to do exactly that. And, um, so the, one of the uh, seminal works was about, uh, b which helped a lot to understand injection is, uh, uh, this work actually analyzes the, the data from <coughs> observations near, uh, in front of the uh, earth bow shock. Uh, another uh, very interesting and important, uh, important contribution was that uh, this uh, deep th theoretical analysis of the structure of some particular particular collisionally shocks and uh, uh, what what I think Charlie managed to do here is to demonstrate uh, that uh, he gave a peace of mind to the astrophysicists in, in the sense that collisionally shocks are not something totally mysterious it's it's a real object which, which uh, behave uh, very much like uh, regular shocks and people started to work with them uh, from, from this perspective and, <coughs> and uh, uh, really uh, it was a great, great help for the astrophysical community. <coughs> uh, the, uh, then an, another interesting aspect uh, uh, which regard uh, actually uh, directly the collision shocks and uh, Charlie and Ralt managed to built a, a sort of <coughs> first principle uh, model and example of spe quite specific collision shocks supported by fire hose instability. And uh, this is one of the basic plasma instabilities that Raul suggested uh, uh, early. And, and uh, this was, uh, I think, one of the first uh, uh, quite <coughs> non-trivial example of, of collision shocks uh, requiring uh, instability and modes that support uh, as, as a nonlinear entity of plasma dynamics that can support this, uh, this very complicated object as collision shocks. And uh, then uh, 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 another interesting uh, example is, uh, is also uh, what, what can plasma physics can bring to the uh, astrophysics and what uh, what is really appreciated and and it is still having a great impact on on the on the uh, research in the field of uh, cosmic ray transport uh, where where the concept of self confinement is now making uh, its way to to the uh, to the forefront of of this research and uh, and the self-confinement is the idea that particles that are essentially unstable and <coughs> uh, in, a, in a sort of non-equilibrium state, they drive waves and the waves uh, help to confine these particles and keep them accelerated, etc. So uh, there are many, many, of course, many other contributions that Charlie made uh, to, to this field and we, we are still using them and they are appreciate, uh, appreciated and I think uh, <coughs> Ferd Karaniti will uh, talk more about uh, the pulsar physics and uh, about uh, other aspects of high energy astrophysics that Charlie contributed uh, so significantly. So conclu conclusion is uh, simple, it's, uh, it's, I, I, I want to uh, uh, argue against uh, Bruno remarked that uh, no, Charlie's work is still uh, uh, updated and uh, it is still uh, making a very significant impact on uh, high energy astrophysics. Thank you. So, I'm, I'm not contradicting what you said, but 
they are new information on, on shockwave that came from the Voyager. I was in charge of plasma physics at the encounter with Uranus. And the shockwave in front of Uranus, they never did anything original, you know, from Rowan and Charlie and so on, uh, did not confirm what we know. For example, the oscillation in the magnetic field. You know, the shock is not like in a fluid, as yeah. you said correctly. Did not comply with the theory at all. But NASA did not like new discovery. Everything had to be according to plan. So the paper published on the uh, shock of Uranus obeys the uh, ranking you got me relation with that, and that is not true. It doesn't have my name. The one on Uranus, yes, it has my name. But then there is another one brought about by the Voyager spacecraft, another crisis. They expected that the high energy particle present in the solar wind, at, you know, about 100 astronomical units, would be generated by the so-called terminal shock. When they crossed the terminal shock, <coughs> they were not generated by the terminal shock. So then there is a crisis. And one of the ideas that would be magnetic reconnection. So I think there is need to, for Ron and Charlie to get that together and reconsider that because the real experimental data. Yeah, I, I agree that it's very hard to trace particles back to their source. That's, that's the nature of these particles. They, uh, orbits are uh, strongly no, scrambled and... Everybody was sure, you know, that Dr. But that crossing the turbulent shock that yeah. would reveal that after that, yeah. there were no hands, they come yeah. from beyond. Yeah. Oh, so oh sure. <laughs> or we oh, yeah, the, there are, there are ma many mysterious things yeah. going on, in, in, and so the same is true for supernova remnant shocks. People observe things that are not, not entirely consistent with our uh, current understanding of collision shocks, but uh, more interesting is the future, I think. It's Bruno, one of the great advantages in science is to be able to agree with everybody. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> in, in the case of collision with shocks, in the, in the formation phases of the subject, there were models of perpendicular shocks and models of parallel shocks and models in high beta and models in low beta. They all look different. And they were all right. Yeah. <laughs> and the problem is that uh, that you have to know the parameters that in the upstream flow very precisely yes. to know what kind of acceleration you're going to get. Yes. And so uh, when you start studying individual crossings in space, uh, you've got to know a lot before you know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's exactly what is shown here from, from your paper. Yeah. Yeah, Bruno, this terminal shock, I think, situation is that yes. uh, solar wind expanding yes. uh, is losing energy due to charge exchange with uh, uh, neutral uh, hydrogen atoms. Yes. And uh, at, at the end, terminal shock has a very small mass number, very modest mass number. You see, it's not and uh, Fermi uh, acceleration spectra, uh, if you use a shock model, uh, strongly depends on the mass number, and it is, you know, extremely steep. It goes down very quickly with high energy at low mass numbers, according to the, this classical formula, which was uh, derived by Roger Blanford and few others. Yeah. But then, Robert, okay, that would explain why. But then they are made by another mechanism. What is? Oh, it, 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 could, it could be uh, it could be a Fermi of second uh, time. Yes, a second order Fermi. Yeah. Well, we we tried. Yeah. You know, there is a, yeah. a current sheet. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, absolutely. absolutely. And actually, uh, uh, I was thinking that someone would talk about uh, reconnection work and uh, uh, instabilities and de uh, different detectors. But Charlie was working especially in relation to some stones. Maybe someone would mention it. Well, you know, one of the yeah, key options is coming up is third. Yeah. And so yeah. let's give him a chance yeah. that we can continue to argue. <laughs> then there'll be a coffee break and you can go at it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Ferret Karanichi uh, was uh, uh, very active uh, uh, in, in uh, actively participating in the joint works with Charlie throughout many years in UCLA. 
uh, intermittently he was a uh, uh, chairman of the physics department uh, over there. And uh, you saw his name in uh, some of the papers uh, on shocks. He also prominently uh, was uh, in uh, reconnection uh, field, also with Charlie, with uh, Alex Galeev, and he was visiting. So let him speak. Okay, thank you, Roald. Um, I hope they'll get a pointer. So I'm going to talk about a particular astrophysical object, the Crab Nebula, that Charlie was involved with in sort of the late 1970s and early 1980s, and ended up writing two of the most famous papers in theoretical astrophysics on this object. I'll talk a little bit about what was done at that time, the basic MHD model of the Crab Pulsar wind and its interaction with the nebula, and then I'll try to bring Charlie up to date because he's had his interests elsewhere uh, in the meantime um, on what's been happening at the, um, observationally in the crab and what sort of the current status of the crab is. If I can manage to do two things at once. Crab Nebula is a supernova remnant that was formed in an explosion in 1054 AD. It was observed in the Middle East and in China possibly by the Southwest Indians. If any of you have ever been to Montezuma's castle in uh, Arizona, there's a pictograph on the wall that we think is actually a picture of the Crab Nebula. It was visible during the day for a period of about a month or so. Gives you some idea of how bright it was. Today, it's a region that's <clears throat> about three by six light years or one by two parsecs in the distance pref units preferred by astronomers. It's still expanding with a velocity of about 1,400 kilometers a second. That's 50 times faster than the Earth goes around the sun. And the expansion rate is actually increasing, so it's accelerating. What you see in the blue light here is synchrotron radiation. It was predicted by the great Russian theoretical astrophysicist Igor Slavsky in 1953, confirmed by measurements made in the Soviet Union and, and on Mount Palomar by Walter Botta in 1954. It is made by relativistic electrons and positrons that are spiraling around in magnetic fields that thread throughout this region. The red light that you see here is for hydrogen recombination radiation for, from the remnants of the star that exploded uh, back then. The crab radiates across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, the nebula itself. Here's a superposed image of the X-ray emission, the optical emission, and finally the radio emission. And notice that the highest energy photons come from the inner part of the nebula. The optical radiation extends somewhat further out, and the radio radiation uh, fills throughout the whole nebula. This whole glowing region of hot relativistic particles is confined by the outermost layers of the nebula of the star that exploded. Here's the electromagnetic spectrum of the crab. Uh, I don't expect you, this is spectral energy distribution as a function of frequency or, or energy up there. You can see the nebula radiates across that whole region. Main thing is that the total radiated luminosity that's coming out in photons from the nebula is 10 to the 38 thirds per second. The total energy of the, of the nebula itself, including its expansion energy, is about five times that. And to put that in context, that's 100,000 times more energy than our sun puts out every second. Okay? So the crab requires a powerful energy source that's acting today. And that energy source is, of course, the crab pulsar. Now, the basic picture of pulsars stems from the, it's er, just shortly after its discovery. What a pulsar is is a neutron star, an object that's about 10 kilometers in radius, but with a mass of the sun, about 1.44 times the mass of the sun, if you want to be precise about it. Uh, it's spinning on it, <clears throat> rotating around at, in the crab's case, 33 milliseconds is its period, so one, 30 times a second it makes one complete rotation. It's, dom it's dominated by a magnetic field. It's incredibly strong. 
It's four times 10 to the 12th Gauss at the poles. That's about a million times stronger than we can produce on the Earth today. This magnetic field is so strong that if you send a photon through it, the photon is unstable. It breaks down into electron and positron pairs. That <coughs> first model of that was worked out by Peter Golreich and his student Julian in 1969. And it, they predict basically that every second, 10 to the 38th electrons and positrons are produced in these vacuum discharges that occur around the poles of the star. This plasma that's created flows out on open field lines that then f makes its way from this object at 10 kilometer scale out to the Crab Nebula via a relativistic wind that carries basically the spin down luminosity that's associated with the star. All of this is being powered by the rotational kinetic energy stored in the star. And you can calculate what that is, and that's the 5 times 10 to the 38 set ergs per second, the power, the Crab Nebula. So all of that energy that's powering that region at several light years in extent is coming from this little 10 kilometer object. The key parameter of this relativistic wind, which will feature in our story, is the ratio of the pointing flux, that is the fl energy that's carried by the electromagnetic field, to the kinetic energy that's carried by the plasma. Kurt Michael named this sigma, and it's a, it's a notation which is stuck in the field, so I'll refer to it as the sigma issue. Uh, but it's basically just the, 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 the difference between the amount of energy that the magnetic field or electromagnetic field carries and the amount of energy that's carried by the particles. The pair production models at 10 to the 38th are sufficient to explain the optical to the gamma ray emission from the nebula. That is, you need to accelerate electrons and positrons, and you, this is the number you need every second to, do, to, to explain the, the, the radiation that we see. The radio radiation requires about three orders of magnitude more particles per second to be produced. That remains, uh, as you will see, a mystery. The basic structure of the nebula was worked out by Mar Lord Martin Rees in, uh, he wasn't a Lord then, but he is now, uh, and, and Jim Gunn from Princeton in 1974. They simply pointed out that the, this relativistic wind that's coming from this little object in the center, let's see if I can steady that pointer a little bit, coming from this object in the center, the pulsar, flows out and it's supersonic. It's the, the, it, that wind, however, is confined by the remnant that was left by the supernova explosion. So there has to be a, a shock transition that takes you from sub supersonic flow to subsonic flow. And that shock transition occurs within about a tenth of a parsec or so of the pulsar. And it occurs when the ram pressure of the wind is comparable to the thermal and magnetic pressure in the nebula. The, the, the star is spinning, and this is probably its rotation axis. The magnetic field is spun out in, this, in the equatorial plane, and the dominant relativistic wind comes out in a rotational equator of the pulsar. It wraps the magnetic field around, so the magnetic field is primarily toroidal. And what you see here is in the X-ray observations from the Chandra Observatory, basically a toroidal-like structure. And it's that toroidal-like structure that's, that represents the magnetic field. I would say that by the late 1970s, the recent gun picture was pretty well confirmed. That is, we more or less understood the energetics of the nebula and more or less understood its magnetohydrodynamic structure as a consequence. And it was at this point, in the end of the 70s and early 80s, that Charlie got interested in trying to make a more refined model of, the, of this interaction as a way both of confirming the existence of a, of a collision with shock and understanding, understanding where the plasma physics that was associated with the pulsar and with the relativistic wind uh, could explain the, obs the observed radiation that was coming from the nebula. And so here is his calculations on the, um, an MHD flow model for the radiation from the crab. What you saw in the earlier slide is that the highest energy photons come from the nearest region of the, around the pulsar. The lowest ener lower energy photons come from further out. So the first thing Charlie did is calculate the angular width 
of the nebula as a function of the photon energy, ranging in, in from about in optical photons out to several MeV energies. What you see here in the dots are the, cur are the data that existed at that time, and here's the theoretical curve that Charlie calculated. The physics is simple. Synchrotron radiation, the power, it depends on the square of the energy, the gamma square being the, related to the energy through the Lorentz factor. And so the highest energy uh, particles emit energy more, more rapidly. They burn off and lose energy. They, and as they flow outwards from the star and into the nebula, they don't, there aren't enough high energy photons further out to make high energy radiation. So th th that basically explains the obser obser observed structure of the nebula as a function of frequency. The key calculation, however, in that work was the calculation of the spectrum, that is the energy as a function of frequency that's radiated by the post-shock flow. He adopted the classic canonical cosmic ray spectrum that Misha just talked about and as the spectrum that the electrons and positrons got just behind the shock, that is the downstream flow, and worked out the, op the, the radiation. These are theoretical curves. The A, B, and C were the known observational points at that time. And he f basically determined a set of parameters for the relativistic wind coming from the pulsar that, exp that would explain the observed radiation and its spectral shape as well. The spectral shape is determined by the flow of the MHD flow in the nebula. The key parameter, this parameter sigma, the ratio of, of, of electromagnetic pointing flux to kinetic energy flux, he determined had to be about 0.003. Now, that confirmed a guess that recent Gunn had made, that the relativistic wind had to be dominated by kinetic energy. And it's a mere factor of 10 million smaller than is predicted by all current models of pulsars. Current models of pulsars say that the electromagnetic energy should dominate by many orders of magnitude than the kinetic energy that's produced in the electromagnetic, break, electromagnetic breakdown of the vacuum. And even by the loose standards of theoretical astrophysics, numerology, a factor of 10 to the seventh is a bit uh, <clears throat> preoccupying, as they say. Well, what I'd like to do now is say this paper was published in 1984. It's still today is frequently cited. It's hard to pick up a, a journal of the astro, a copy of the Astrophysical Journal in which there isn't some citation to this, to this work, even going on now. So what's happened since that time? Well, the expansion of the wind from the pulsar's magnetosphere out to the distance where it's shocked is, is a factor of 10 to the ninth in radius. You would expect at that point that any inhomogeneities that were associated with this pulsar and its structure and the magnetosphere would have been washed away. And so that what should be entering the nebula would be very smooth, varying, very smoothly varying in space and temporally steady as a consequence. Here are observations from the Chandra Observatory in X-rays and from the Hubble Space Telescope in optical radiation of what the region in the immediate vicinity of the pulsar and its, and its shock look like. And the first thing one notes is in the X-rays is hot spots. This ring here is supposed to be the shock that terminates the supersonic wind, and it should be reasonably smooth by the previous arguments, and it's not. And furthermore, it doesn't, it, it varies in these, in these spatial bright spots vary in time. Here they're not there, here they are. The other thing is that this is still a quasi-relativistic flow. And in a relativistic flow, when the fluid is flowing at you and radiating, it boosts the frequency of the photons and therefore the brightness of the intensity of the spectrum. When the fluid is flowing away, the, it, it Doppler dims the spectrum. That simply isn't seen. There isn't any obvious dimming of, of the fluid that's flowing away from that if it's coming toward us. In the optical, and somewhat in the X-ray still, one sees what are called wisps. These were first detected by Lansdale in 1922, followed up by pioneering work at the Lick Observatory in 1969 by Jeff Scargill. 
there are re hot spots. And these hot spots vary in time. They also, waves tend to propagate at a f sizable fraction of the speed of light from one of these wisps to the outer, outermost ones. And this had been studied in great detail by Jim Hester using Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope. So what, w what we've learned from the inner parts of the nebula, that what should have been a smooth shock transition is much more complicated that the, the shock and the wind are spatially structured, temporally variable. Furthermore, there is no clear association with any of this nebular activity with any activity that's associated with the pulsar. And so the interaction is a little bit more complicated than we had imagined back in the early 1970s and 80s. One possibility that it, it is that the composition of the wind may be more complicated in itself. In, 19, in the early 1990s and then followed up later in, in 2004, John Ahrens and his students, Gallant and Spitosky, uh, proposed that the wind also carries a significant flux of heavy ions that are ripped out of the surface of the star and propagate out. When these heavy ions are shocked, at the, they basically start to gyrate in the magnetic fields downstream, and their gyro orbits are in fact macroscopic. They're on the order of a fraction of a parsec, which we can now resolve in, in, in optical telescopes anyway. And the, the, the gyrations re represent currents that bunch the magnetic field, concentrate the magnetic field, and when you compress the magnetic field, that increases the synchrotron radiation. So these wisps, and this is a simulation study, uh, are, are bright regions uh, may be associated with the gyro motion of, uh, that we actually see of heavy ions. The, the gyro orbits are unstable. As you can see, they, beca they become chaotic. They radiate. Uh, magnetosonic waves, which are basically just sound waves traveling in a magnet magnetized plasma. Those sound waves travel out from wisp, wisp one to wisp two at a significant fraction of the speed of light. So again, the, the situation may be more complicated than we originally asked, figured. More recently, the Fermi Gamma Ray Observatory and the European AGIO Gamma Ray Observatory detected flares that are c coming from the Crab Nebula itself. These flares occur at energies in photons with energies greater than 100 million electron volts. They uh, are not associated or, cor or correlated with any uh, thing that's happening at the pulsar, and they are not detected at X ray or optical wavelengths either. But a significant brightening of these very energetic part gamma rays. It seemed to indicate that rapid acceleration must be going on within the Crab Nebula itself. Here's just a picture of the energy flux from the, from the Crab from, uh, during a major flare. These flares are, are tapping about 1% of the spin down luminosity of the pulsar. That's not an inconsequential amount of energy, okay? And so it's hard to understand. The best understanding of it, and to satisfy Roald, I'll, I'll mention it, uh, has to do with a certain process, magical astrophysical process that goes by the name of reconnection, that the magnetic field in the nebula has regions of opposite polarity. These, pol these regions of field can come together and annihilate, converting the magnetic energy into uh, electrical energy and, or, and particle energy. Particles then are accelerated along the neutral lines in this magnetic field. And this is wor recent work by Saruti, Werner, Yuzdensky, and Begelman, which seem to account for the observed temporal profile of these, f of these bursts, gamma ray uh, flares, and the spectrum. And so maybe, uh, the, again, the, uh, indicating that the region of the nebula itself is more complicated than we originally might have thought. And so, what are today's current crab nebula conundrums? The sigma problem. How do you go from a pointing dominated flux by orders of magnitude to a kinetic energy dominated flux, uh, a, a, a relativistic wind? Does it occur in the zone between the pulsar and the, the shock? The magnetic field in here should be striped, that is, it has, should have regions of alternating polarity. 
They could, that, those stripes could annihilate either in that region or at the shock itself and give up, that, give up the magnetic energy. We really don't know. The sh radio emission threads throughout the nebula. We still don't understand where the relativistic electrons and positrons come from that provide that radiation. Or do we understand the number of particles, how, or where the number of particles per second that, ha that, have, that have to carry that? The wisps downstream, it, are they indicating that the wind is in fact carrying a sizable flux of heavy ions? Other possibilities have been mentioned that the nebula is k MHD kink unstable and the kink are producing the wisps. And finally, the flares. They have re recently discovered, is it localized reconnection or are there other instabilities going on? And so I'd like to end by just simply saying we may be facing the Kuhnian question. That's after Thomas Kuhn, the historian of science who wrote the book, The Copernican Revolution, which changed the way we viewed the progress of science. Are we simply, as in the old Aristotelian days, going to face with saving the appearances? A few tweaks of the old model, a few new bells and whistles added to it, but basically we could understand all of this. Or are we facing a more fundamental paradigm change in our understanding of the crab and nebula? The crab has been called the Rosetta Stone of theoretical astrophysics, and it remains so today. And that much of what we've un what we understood uh, about energy, high energy astrophysics was first worked out for the crab. We have in the audience today several of the world's most distinguished theoretical astrophysicists, and so perhaps they would like to comment on the Kuhnian question. But before doing so, it's always useful to remember the wise words of Willie Fowler, who in a quote from, paraphrase of a quote from Thomas Hux Huxley said, the terrible tragedies of science are the horrible murders of beautiful theories by ugly facts. <laughs> Thank you very much. Of course. Russian discovery of the polarization of the optical intuition was made by a gentleman named Domhofsky. Yeah. It was very sad for him. He looked for optical polarization and other nebulae the rest of his career never found anything. <laughs> the, the American confirmation was a series of plates taken by that well known California astronomer at the Princeton Station. Okay. Thank you. Walter Bottom was also a plane. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any chance that dark matter could have a, uh, uh, any influence? I mean, you have very, uh, 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 a very dense region uh, uh, where, where you're getting gamma rays uh, from, 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 from space. Now, dark matter is not supposed to interact with electromagnetic theory, but uh, could there be any other interaction? These, these, the fluxes that we see from the crowd are just overwhelm anything in a dark matter source. Generally, on these spatial scales, dark matter is very, should be very smooth. Um, but when you talk about the galaxy, that's a different matter. There, you, know, there, there you begin to have <coughs> enough gravity to affect the distribution of dark matter. You know, we've been connected with the Angela group, the discord declares. But another phenomenon that you mentioned quickly, th there is a dimple that seems to be affected by you call it a kinky stability, probably involved in reconnection. Can you say more on that? What do you? I, I don't know that much about it. And again, the, these observations are still relatively new. They're new. Yeah. Let's hear from Martin. Yeah. This is a question, not a comment, to uh, either of the last two speakers. We know how computer modeling has taken over much of astrophysics. And one area where this has happened is uh, the work of Stokowski and people like that in uh, computing particle trajectories in relativistic shocks, etc. <coughs> Would you like to comment on how far this has to go and how important it's going to be? We should perhaps, that, that sounds like a question more to you. Yeah. 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 Indeed, uh, there was a tremendous progress in simulations uh, recently uh, but uh, if, if you speak about uh, 
particular objects like supernova remnants, for instance, where you need to uh, simulate uh, a particle over the entire history when, when it starts from the thermal pool and gets to the 10 to the 15. It's a huge dynamical range. And I think uh, currently uh, simulations are able to, <coughs> to reproduce only um, piecewise this, this history. So if they can uh, address, for instance, the initial part of acceleration, which is called injection, then they can uh, reasonably well describe uh, me uh, the middle of this story, the acceleration. But altogether, when particles start to leave, they, they spread over larger and larger distances, and you, you need uh, bigger and bigger uh, grid on, on your computer, and this is still uh, not, not realistic, so. But issues like the uh, spectrum of the particles. That's, uh, the, the, the thing is. Acceleration of different species. Yes, that's, that's a good point. But, but the thing is that uh, the nature of this acceleration process is, is such that uh, the spectrum, the energy spectrum, is quite tightly uh, coupled to the special scale. So if, if your special resolution in, uh, in computer is limited, then uh, the energy description is also limited in this way. You, you can just either describe thermal, super thermal uh, transition well, very carefully with all the waves, or you can just have a gross picture, which, you know, sort of. I hate to interrupt, but I'd like yeah. to comment that one of the terrible tragedies in a conference like this is the murder of beautiful conversations by coffee break. Right. <laughs> so, but I think it's, I think it's time, and uh, there's the hallways outside. Right. Let's thank all this. <laughs>